With a view to what we can expect, let's take a look at the Scottish Highlands, where seven years ago, after full-scale public hearings, onshore oil development had its effects on the small community of Kishorn. This oil production platform, the largest object man has ever made to float, was built near Kishorn, a community of several hundred people. The impact of this development is recalled by Kishorn councillor Alex McBeath. It wasn't what we would have opted for. It was too big, entirely in keeping with the character and uh, nature of the area, but still we had to take it. In the 1970s, major oil discoveries were made off the coast of the Shetland Islands. To get the oil up from the seabed, a huge oil production platform had to be built. Britain, to ease its unemployment and debt situation, was anxious to get in on the work. Let's get a little background on this from a planner with the Highlands and Islands Development Board, so, Mr. Stanley Pickett. Down. Similarly, platforms had to be built. They required uh, a certain technical capacity for the dock and they required deep water nearby and the number of sites which were suitable was fairly limited and those were the sites that had to be used if we were going to participate at all in this venture. Drambui in the Scottish Highlands was the industry's first choice but before the industry moved in the community expressed its fears through a public hearing process. The public hearings brought out a number of major concerns. What would be the effect of many hundreds of highly paid migrant workers suddenly arriving in a small community? Would there be a clash between their 12 hour a day, 7 day a week lifestyle and that of the local residents? Could this influx of new people permanently change the character of the area? It was feared that people might leave small scale traditional industries for high wages. Overall, would there be enough long-term employment and other benefits to local residents to make this project worthwhile? In the end, the Drambui site was rejected, not because of concerns raised at the public inquiry, but because the proposed site was an historic location. We'll get a few comments on what happened next from sociologist Adrian Varwell. But paradoxically, the people who live to the north of Loch Carron uh, were very much in favor of the development at Drumbui and almost in the closing stages of the uh, public inquiry into the Drumbui development planning permission was given for a site at Kishorn on the north shore of Loch Carron. And it was largely because of the shortage of jobs in the area that the local community and the crofting community within reach of the Loch Kishorn site um, on the whole welcomed the arrival of this very large and strange and unknown industry. We were very frightened of the, uh, the impact of this thing. It's something new, is a heavy industry. We would never have opted for this type of thing, but it, it was this or nothing. And so the show simply moved down the road to Kishorn, this time without a public hearing and without major objections, at least from the locals. Mrs. Gilmore owns and operates a local weaving yeah, business. Unfortunately, a lot of the, the people who, who live in Loch Carran and who were so against the development were not natives of Loch Carran. They were people who had come in from other places, from the south, and some had built just holiday homes here, and some had come semi-retired or retired, and they um, had the, the louder voice of the people who were against the development. I don't know, they seem to want peace and quiet, and they say they've come from the rock race in the south, but you can still get many quiet corners in the south, just the same as up here. I feel that we're going to be swamped as a community here, altogether, and uh, I just don't, uh, it's spoiling the village even now. We're sorry to leave the house mm. and the community and our friends here. Yes, of course we've got regrets about leaving, but 
we feel we've got to go now, you see, so that's, that's it. It is most unfortunate, this development is as alien to this area as the establishment of a Crofton Township would be in Hyde Park. A few public meetings were held, and very quickly afterwards, the excavation work began. With an eye to objections raised at the Drambui public hearings, a number of promises were made to the community by the Howard Doris Company. No more than 400 men were to be employed at any one time. Sunday work was to occur only when necessary. All shipments were to occur by sea as the existing road systems were inadequate and the men were to live in a village of their own to minimize the strain on local services. I suppose what we're trying to provide is a total village in itself, in its own right. We're something like eight miles from the nearest village, which is relatively small, something like 400, 500 inhabitants. And we're trying to provide here, um, a, if you like, a replica of, of that situation, where the guys can get every service that they want. Developers built a work camp to meet the best hotel standards. Everything was provided for a maximum of 400 men. But as the townspeople soon found out, all this was not enough. This huge construction project took on a momentum of its own. The Reverend John Rost is chairman of the local council. Howard Doris came to Loch Caron and they arranged a public meeting. And at the public meeting, they told us something about their plans. They gave us some idea of the size of the project, said they would employ approximately 700 men. They also assured us that uh, there would be no work on the Lord's Day, and Sir John Howard assured us that he himself was a Christian and he would never think of working on the Lord's Day. And uh, that's really, that's one of the main bones of contention that they undertook not to work on the Lord's Day and that their promises were completely disregarded. Not only did their workforce escalate from 700, but it went up to 3,000. Brian Wilson is editor of the West Highland Free Press. Howard Doris came in here on a total con. Um, that they were very astute operators, that when they came in here, that everybody's attention was diverted uh, to Drumbui. Everyone was looking at Drumbui, the kind of great cause celebre of bl British planning history. And at this time, when uh, Taylor Woodrow and Molums were talking about a thousand men at Drumbui, Howard Doris with a nice old Sir John come along, hold public meetings, say, we only want a little thing, 400 men, we'll put trees round it, and everyone says, well, that doesn't sound so bad. So in they come, totally cynically from that moment on, they have taken every planning condition going and have smashed it with, with just total disregard for all the promises given. It's ridiculous to say that we conned anybody because we put in our application what we knew and then accepted an order for something much bigger. Initially, the uh, project was just begun before something for 400 men for a nice small platform, which she through public inquiries and all that, took such a long time that uh, that small platform was built in Sweden. But uh, the company were fortunate enough in getting the order for this large one. Uh, meant a lot more people, the workers coming in. The townspeople just didn't expect something this size. Well, I think maybe it was bigger than what the people expected it to be. It turned out to be on a much bigger mm -hmm. scale than what they expected it to be. We were literally swamped. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was hardly a house. If you had a biggish house, we were used to make fun. Take care that you don't have squatters when you go home tonight. That was the mm -hmm. extent of the desperation for accommodation at one stage. We had an old Christian literature book van which went off the road and 
four Irishmen bought it and used it as sleeping accommodation. I think there are two features of oil development in a rural area such as the Highlands of Scotland. One is the sheer scale of the enterprise and the second is the speed with which it operates. The labour force of 400 was far too small. Uh, whether the contractors knew this at the outset I don't know. But one of the problems with North Sea oil development of course is that it's done against the clock and rather than extend contract times, the major contractors tend to build up their labor force. And so the project grew, riding roughshod over the original promises of the developers. Only essential work was to take place on Sunday, but it was surprising what became essential. All deliveries to the site were to come by ship, but it was soon apparent that contractors had little control over their subcontractors. and the roads were used beyond their capacity. The men were to live in a village of their own, but soon all hotels and rooming houses were filled for miles around, and trailer camps sprung up. For senior executives, new housing was built at the end of the village. In the face of all this, what influence can local government have on the developers of a major project? One finds that the, they have to have a measure of public support and goodwill from the, the areas they work in. If not, then the, they'll find that they are not going to succeed in, in getting planning permission, say, for a certain development or uh, other development of their uh, complex and they want to build a cinema or something like Well, if they're going to, you know, if they do not consider the interest of the thing, well, the local authorities can have a tight measure of control on them, on planning things. So it's in the developer's interest to, uh, to uh, sort of negotiate with uh, the local people and, and to consider their interests as well as their own. It's very difficult. There are areas where you can enforce pressure and areas where you can't. But of course, with the oil business, there's always this sort of economic pressure, often termed in terms of the national interest. And there are very few planning authorities who are going to really stick their neck out against the argument of the national interest and thereby slow down the completion of a project. Well, you don't give carte blanche to your developers at any time. You must always keep a measure of local control over it. Because we must bear in mind that the developer is there to develop and carry out his development as, with as much profit as possible. So how did the people of Kishorn cope with all this? What was the impact on the social life of their community? As originally intended, should the incomers have stayed on their own? I think this is something that, that uh, has to be watched very carefully. I, I think it's dangerous if you're going to make two classes of citizens in an area. And uh, I think one has to bear in mind the need for making sure that there is a certain amount of integration that the cultures the attitudes, characteristics of the community are sort of maintained as much as possible and perhaps adopted by the new people.